supply chain has gotten a lot harder <laughs> over the past two years. Predictive procurement orchestration is a very heavy word. It's a very new concept right now. We're going to see it in marketing orchestration and finance orchestration and sales orchestration. Mm -hmm. Hundreds of predictive sourcing cycles in many different categories. This video is brought to you by us, SCM Dujo. We provide awesome courses, guides, best practices for, for supply chain community. Hi folks, welcome to one more episode of Supply Chain Show. Today, I'm going to talk about a very interesting topic, which is predictive procurement orchestration. It's a very heavy word, it's a very new concept right now, and how I come across this concept. I've been invited by Orchestra, previously BidOps, a, a silicon-based, you know, silicon Valley startup. They're doing a fantastic job. And I was invited in the conference on October 22, and this that day basically opened my eyes, right? I come across this concept, and I think all procurement professionals must know about it, right? And there's no better person to basically explain than Edmund himself. He's a CEO, and was a CEO of um, not BidOps <laughs> Orchestra right now. He's with us. He's he, this startup was started in 2017, and I have seen the growth of this company in front of my eyes, right? So recently they got funding, they got a new co-founder. Um, I would like to hear more from Edwin himself. Edwin, welcome to the show. Just tell us what's happening, right? So the change of the name, you know, the progress, the funding, tell us about it, what's happening. Thanks, Dr. Mirasir. It's it's a pleasure to speak with you and uh, always exciting to to be able to share, share an update with your audience. You know, I think the major change that we we woke up to was really driven by our customers right. and our customers really came to us and they said three things they said one and no surprise to you or, or many of your listeners supply chain has gotten a lot harder <laughs> over the past two years <laughs> there's more work to do there's more fires to put out and as supply chains are disrupted with very real material shortages and bottlenecks, at the same time, you're seeing the increase in regulatory complexity. You're seeing demands for ESG to be incorporated in supply chain planning. And of course, innovation hasn't slowed down at all. <laughs> if you yeah. look at the stock market, um, some of the technology companies that are building new hardware, building new types of processors and chips, they've uh, they've been printing money. And so at the same time that it's harder and harder <laughs> to do the supply chain job, um, there's also a greater urgency around getting it right. So that was the first thing that our, our customers said. The second thing that our customers said is, hey, in a short market, the traditional procurement process of like RFP, RFQ, which assumes Abundant supply, competition between suppliers, and uh, you know, competition for customers. In some markets, that's flipped. There are more customers than there are supply sources, and so, in some cases, the old ways of doing things stopped working entirely. Or companies said we need to take a strategic pause to work with our 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 really tight strategic supplier partners to figure out the changing market dynamics. And the third thing that our customers said is, wow, it is so hard to hire good people. <laughs> the talent shortage in specifically in supply chain and procurement has never been more acute. Yeah. And the reason is simple. It's because you have domain experts that know their categories and know their suppliers like the back of their hand. And then you have people that are really good at advanced Excel, data and analytics, and some of the newer tooling around machine learning. And those two are different people <laughs> in most cases, right? It's really hard to hire someone who knows ocean freight yeah. or knows MRO, and then also has those same analytical uh, and uh, quantitative skills. And so what we realized was that these problems are too big and too pervasive to be solved with a uh, in a user-driven application, and this this was a big wake up for us because you know for the beginning part of our life cycle as a company, we'd really thought I mean about software as kind of a 
application driven experience. And what I mean by that is if you've used a software application either on your phone or on your desktop, it typically look something like this. <laughs> Some coworker or colleague says, hey, <laughs> we're all using this platform to, to, to do this supply chain task and, and you're gonna get a, a link and you can log in and create a password and set up your profile. And then you can create some projects and you can add or import information or data into those projects. And then you can track progress over time and you can collaborate with your colleagues. And in some cases you can even collaborate with your suppliers if you're um, uh, in, in supply chain. So that's kind of like the paradigm, the, the paradigm that I feel like a lot of technology has been, has been operating under. And one of the things that we realized from our customers who are dealing with, again, disrupted supply chains, um, you know, the talent shortage, and then just really trying to figure out how to, how to get the work done and deliver at a high, high level of performance, um, that having a process that relied on a long technology implementation and a lot of user training was just a non-starter for, yeah. for so many of these companies. And so that's really where we saw orchestration, which is kind of the, one of the key concepts in predictive procurement orchestration mm -hmm. really coming in. And orchestration is actually something that we're going to see, I think, in every major category of technology. We're going to see it in marketing orchestration and finance orchestration and sales orchestration. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the first areas that we're seeing this new category is in payments, payments orchestration. And so what's interesting is that if you look at all of these different technology categories and, and what orchestration means, it arises when there are too many systems, too many processes, and people are overwhelmed with the amount of information. Yeah. And orchestration, the whole point of it is, is just like an orchestra. There are many different instruments and you have to get them all kind of playing, <laughs> playing in tune, playing in harmony around the right time so that you can get a process done and deliver business value. Cause that's at the end of the day, what, what really matters. Right. And so we said orchestration sounds like uh, a better approach than this user driven software construct. So we knew orchestration had to be, had to be part of it from what our customers have said. And then of course our um, technology differentiation since we started has always been around predictive pricing and supplier recommendations. Our machine learning engine simulates prices and ranks suppliers using a, a wide combination of, of, of multiple uh, variables and factors. Um, some using a customer's internal data, some yeah. using external data available on the open internet. And we pull it all together. And unlike the traditional sourcing process, we continuously monitor and rank suppliers based on their ongoing purchasing behavior, as well as kind of forward looking sourcing activities. So we said, well, we're already the, the leader in predictive sourcing or strategic sourcing done with predictive analytics. We call it predictive mm -hmm. sourcing. And we're already the leader in predictive purchasing. Why not bring all of that together in predictive procurement, but instead of having it be user driven through software, mm -hmm. have it be an orchestration platform where people can uh, customize rules engines based on their industry, based mm -hmm. on their category, their specific use cases, and then progressively get certain repetitive transactions into a potentially a no touch mm -hmm. workflow where they can automatically be approved based on things everyone agrees are correct and good and, and conforming with the policies and procedures of the business. Mm -hmm. And then free up the procurement team's time to focus on more strategic relationship building and, and analytical tasks. And that allows you to really build a team that has on the one hand, people with really good soft skills that are work with suppliers. And if they also have great analytical skills, amazing, but you can also have the analytical folks that are helping do tracking and reporting, monitoring, and have to spend a lot less time on process management or manual report creation, or just cutting POs, which to this day is what a lot of procurement teams spend their time yeah. doing is cutting purchase orders. Exactly. That, that's good. So very well explained, Ex very well explanation. And I think you, you explained this into your book. Thank you for giving me this book. This looks pretty nice, goes with the branding, right? So uh, before I go to the book, I want to, I have two things you also learn in your conference. 
you have also incorporated some kind of a behavioral sciences right into this whole orchestration so explain about that with that part you explained in your talk was pretty interesting so maybe you want to share that thought process with the with the with the, with the viewers there absolutely and you know it's funny dr mutis here we've We've talked about this in specific cases, also in demand planning and in other aspects of the supply chain. In a lot of cases, and, and for those who are Six Sigma or, 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 or lean proficient, I, I, this may, may resonate. We literally look at how many steps does it take to get to the best outcome? Yeah. How many steps? And so we have this concept in lean of the critical path and the happy path. And a happy path is it's fewer steps to get to a great outcome. It's just easier. There are fewer decisions to make. There are fewer options to consider. And so we actually experience this kind of sense of relief and delight <laughs> and um, uh, confidence that comes from knowing that we have the right path in a few number of steps to a great outcome. Again, kind of bring it back to predictive procurement orchestration as a concept. That's not how most user-driven software programs work. In fact, there are many steps. If you count the number of keystrokes and the number of clicks that it takes to get through a strategic sourcing process in most software platforms, it is a uh, detailed and extravagant choreography <laughs> that in many cases requires detailed training and proficiency in the subject matter and domain expertise. And so what we realized was that, and you know, when we think about it, I, I love to go back to behavioral science. And, and behavioral science is um, a uh, a broad uh, scientific discipline that encompasses behavioral psychology, uh, behavioral economics. And one of the books that I, I love and, and authors that I love, I love Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. And I love the work that Kahneman and Tversky did in creating the field of behavioral economics because I think we're still early days in the application of this science, especially to business processes. And let me, let me explain what I mean very concretely. In most processes, it is more work for a supplier to offer their best price and best terms. And here's what I mean. Suppliers are trained to have many different phases of negotiation. And so because of this, they traditionally, and because it's their job to come up with the price and to come up with the terms that's aligned with their business and ideally makes the customer happy, they will often, and, and all sales training emphasizes this, start anchor high and give a couple terms that are there for the customer to take out of the deal. And if they stay in, then it's great for the supplier and the supplier has leverage later in the process. And on the procurement side, there are so often um, these uh, kind of you know, gluts of work, especially at end of quarter or end of year at strategic times throughout the business calendar, that it is often a simple matter for suppliers to re-articulate their costs, re-articulate their business terms in ways that are strategic and advantageous to their own operations and may create downstream issues for the customer that have to be resolved in a reactive or post hoc manner. Um, I've worked in procurement. I've seen this type of behavior in every uh, industry and category that I've worked in, ranging from healthcare to manufacturing to multi-campus retail. It's not every supplier, but it's enough suppliers that you often, for specific thresholds of spend, require a very detailed uh, and multi-stakeholder approval process, which, as we know from supply chain, is just misaligned with the fast-moving, complex, and constrained nature of a lot of buying channels, especially materials, logistics, and complex services. And so because of all of this, you know, I take an example from Daniel Kahneman's book. He gave this example of the uh, Israeli judges. And actually, I think our friend uh, Yaakov Larson gave, gave this example as well when he was talking about auctions and mm -hmm. um, the, the use uh, of this in negotiation. So they did this study 
um, of Israeli judges who are sit on a parole board when you grant parole to uh, mm -hmm. uh, someone who's been convicted of a crime. Yeah. And what they found was that um, if you look at the uh, distribution of parole, almost all of the paroles were granted at two times of day. Right in the early morning, after the judge got a good night's sleep and feels well rested, relaxed and confident, or right after lunch, where their energy is also at a high level. And the reason that I love this example is because it is much easier cognitively to not grant parole. It's safer for the judges. It's lower risk for them than it is to grant parole. But it is also the right thing to do by the law to grant parole in certain cases. And so... It's a really fascinating measure of how much cognitive work yeah. is required to complete a task. Now, if you think about that in the context of procurement and supply chain, making changes to your supply chain is a huge cognitive lift <laughs> in many cases. Uh, negotiating an agreement is a cognitively intensive task. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. And so if you make that more work, then it's a lot more challenging. But with behavioral science, what we've shown is that recommendations and suggestions yeah. allow you to do, in some cases, a 30 to 50 step process in just one or two steps mm -hmm. by suggesting pricing and suggesting business terms to the supplier at the outset. And then also creating an intelligent, continuous monitoring system around the supplier's uh, preference status to the organization yeah. to procurement. So this is pretty much very opposed to the historic negotiation of the pricing and how you basically deal with your contracts put in place. So allow me to make the whole thing super simple, right? Because I like to make it super simple. So that's what I understand. Or not. So basically what Orchestra has done is it uses the bunch of databases, historical price, historical PL, right? Uses those purchases and the current, you know, macroeconomic, macroeconomic knowledge and take this data out and, and it, it could use COPA or any other, uh, you know, procurement software because your software is, is integrated to any of those softwares, right? You know, all those, you know, all those procurement softwares. And then once you start the sourcing process, so it's basically start with the suggestion. And I, we call this price hinge. No, you use this term. We call this what? When you actually suggest the starting point, uh, it's called, it's known as? Uh, we call it a you know, suggested price. Some people call it a smart, smart default. Okay, cool. Um, right. And yeah, some people just call it a predictive procurement process. Predictive when procurement when process. we take the manual data entry tasks out right. of the process yeah. and replace yeah. them with smart recommendations. So, and that's not smart recommendations. Take all, so that means either you have to be uh, slightly above, then as a supplier, you have to explain why you're slightly above. Maybe you're better, you have better quality, maybe whatever or you're slightly below. And I think what I was, I found very, uh, very interesting, the demo on the conference by our CTO and the team was that how the suppliers can actually see each other apart from the first two, right? So explain what is the thought process? Because I find it very interesting that you're actually letting suppliers see each, each other bid. So explain that part a bit more. Well, Dr. Munister, I do have to, I do have to correct you on that front. So right. cool. we, first of all, I should say that most of the transactions that our platform supports have only one supplier. Ah, okay. In other words, there's no optionality at all. And in many cases, the business stakeholder has a very strong opinion about who the supplier should be. <laughs> um, and in some cases, the um, service levels in the event it's a complex services agreement or lead time and minimum order quantity in the event that it feeds into a constrained demand plan or a manufacturing process. And so the question is right now, you can say in the old world, the process for establishing a price, if it's not part of an existing contract, right. is frequently involves a quote, <laughs> a review step, an approval step, the creation of a purchase requisition, the approval of that requisition, the creation of a purchase order, it's way too many steps. And many of those steps leave an email, um, PDFs and spreadsheets. And so that is the status quo that a lot of our customers have when they come to us and they say, look, we have smart people that are spending all of their time 
emailing with suppliers, getting these PDF quotes, and figuring out how to transfer them into a requisition and into a purchase order. Help us, please. <laughs> we would like to have fewer steps, less typing, period. And we'd like all of the data in our processes to be validated by a machine intelligently and to improve the process, speed up the cycle, make the suppliers get faster POs, the stakeholders get faster processes, purchasing cycles, and procurement to get predictable, repeatable, not just cost savings, but also improved uh, on time in full and supply chain performance. And so that's really where predictive procurement orchestration can play that role. It's not about bidding. You know, right. we do have some people that and some customers, some great customers in the automotive and pharma and food and beverage space that you've met that use this um, for strategic sourcing with multiple suppliers to compare quotes and terms. Right. But our view is that the much more exciting use case is to connect those silos of source to contract and procure to pay, whether you use SAP Ariba, Coupa, Jagger, Zykus, GEP, or whether you use nothing at all, you can still have the benefits of predictive procurement. Back the offers that included many of the suggestions that the model had offered them. And that, that moment, when we saw that, that was a eureka moment. That was the moment that changed everything. Because in that moment, that single moment, BASF, the world's largest chemical company, saved more money faster than they had ever saved in procurement. And this was recognized by the CFO of the company, Tobias Strzok, as the most successful procurement that the company had done globally. They saved 590,000 on uh, 3.6 million in spend for fasteners. But that wasn't the impressive part. The impressive part was that across 5,000 SKUs, it happened in under two weeks. This process was an eight month process with four FTEs. And the thing that impressed them the most, this is a company, by the way, that was using SAP Ariba and Coupa in different parts of their business. What impressed them the most was that no supplier logged into an app. Because I think any of us working in procurement, we know what it's like to do change management with our supplier for uh, our supplier bases. It's not easy. And the procurement manager who did this was recognized for financial excellence by his organization. He was promoted to run procurement for North America, still on the job today. And Sven Tyson, who runs procurement for BASF Coatings, has said that financial results of BitOps are quite impressive. They are excited, and they've done hundreds of predictive sourcing cycles in many different categories, ranging from raw materials to services uh, to MRO. And so Rob said, wow, <laughs> it's pretty cool. Excellent, excellent. Fantastic, thank you for correction. I wasn't sure to listen better. <laughs> now, coming back to the example you gave. So I have recorded your, uh, I think, minute and a half session of the BSF example, right? So guys, I'm going to add it in right now so you can start watching. But what I want to do is also is to explain one more use case, one of your customers, which I've recently seen and maybe explain in some, 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 sort of, some sort of KPIs, right? So what are the bottom line savings, process savings? You, because, you know, for us, stories and examples make more sense than just uh, the process. So share with us one, one use case. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, there's one that I really love, which is actually uh, a process uh, for a custom engineered part with only one supplier. And I love this because this was a part that had been bought on an ad hoc basis when it, when it was needed, it, need, it was needed really fast. <laughs> so the total cycle time, even with people getting on the phone and sending emails, that was supposed to be 48 hours to get the purchase order approved. So really not a lot of time to do a detailed benchmarking <laughs> or get data from different systems or do uh, certainly a, a multi-phase structured negotiation. What Orchestro, what a predictive procurement platform did, and by the way, this was embedded inside of SAP, not Ariba in this particular case, but actually inside of SAP. And it grabbed the requisition data automatically 
fully, fully uh, autonomously. It ran a simulation and compared all of the terms, lead time, conditions with many different possible scenarios to create a intelligent customized benchmark. And then it reached out to the supplier and said, Volkswagen believes that there could be uh, another price. Um, and we're interested if you would be open to agreeing to this price on these terms. And in this particular case, the um, supplier said, oh, of course, we want to be a good supplier. And clearly, this is a way to do that. We love the business. And we're happy to agree. And we're glad that this process is going to result in us getting a faster approval because we're actually going to be able to save money on shipping and we can pass those savings back on to the customer. I say this as an example because this happens every single day. <laughs> These purchases are ongoing. They're for regular orders. And in some cases, you have a price agreement in your MRP or ERP system that is pulling the data from. And in some cases, you don't anticipate the purchase. There's no contract. Yeah. This is one of many types of uh, purchasing cycles that happen at major companies all the time. Cool, cool, cool. Now, come back to the book. Is this book available to purchase somewhere? Dr. Mudisir, it is not. It Advanced is not. copies are only available uh, for people that meet us in person. Okay, nice. So this, I like this heading. It says, how predictive procurement is supercharging strategic finance. What is it? Yes. Explain that, that strategic, so supercharging strategic finance. What does that mean? Well, you know, one thing that I think is so interesting about procurement and supply chain is yeah. that in many different companies, and actually depending on the type of spend, if it's direct or indirect spend, right. you actually have a different reporting structure. Right. And you have, in some cases, different KPIs and different goals. Right. So it's very common for direct materials or direct spend um, for the KPIs to be owned by operations. In this case, uh, you know, on time in full, uh, reduction in non-conforming deliveries or non-conforming parts, and of course, uh, making sure that uh, there are no challenges in getting product to customers on, on, the, on the sell side of the business. And on the indirect side, you often have a reporting structure that may touch operations, but often goes up either to the CFO or the CEO. And so financial KPIs are really critical. Now, what's interesting is that because all of these processes involve money changing hands, they are all dimensions of corporate finance, but without operations, you can't run the company. And so what we're seeing is that uh, operations is becoming more of a strategic finance player and joint P&L owner with yeah. finance. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. finance is becoming more operational. So both sure. sides have, have things to learn from each other. And one of the things that we wanted to emphasize in Predict and Win is that the ability to set targets together as combined functions creates a common language for measuring success and collaborating for supply chain. And it's so much better if we're, if we're inevitably going to live in a world where supply chains are measured both on their cost and their performance, yeah. then why not uh, look and be proactive to create this shared language at our companies so that when we're reporting, we kind of know how to keep score and we have a common language for knowing when we're successful and when there's a problem, when we need to hire more people right. and you know when everyone deserves a bonus or a promotion, that kind of stuff. Okay, I'm going to slightly last two points. I'm gonna digress, right? So I believe the, the, the technology and the, uh, let's call it, yeah, the technology you have built on the philosophy which you explained, which is the, the behavioral sciences, the, the orchestration part, the predictive procurement part, right? that that science in itself can be applied not just in procurement you can really take this technology and go into i don't know financial forecasting almost could, you could go into demand planning and forecasting right into upstream of the, the downstream of the supply chain okay you could really take into for example 
uh, into you know logistics cost calculation, which you if you want to do that, do because that's a big part of the of the PNL, for example. I think that's possible, but given the fact you are the the guys who has invented this, do you see that that playing it out? Or, what, what, I mean, or I'm just talking talking rubbish. <laughs> no, uh, Dr. Mears here, a hundred percent, and and I I want to be clear um, about something, which is that. Um, while we have invented some very interesting applications of technology, the underlying technology itself has actually become ubiquitous. Okay. And what I mean by this is that in every domain of technology, and actually in, in most domains of business in general, you're seeing the emergence of essentially, you could call them uh almost machines that coach in a sense. And what I mean by this is you have, um, you know, essentially networks that repository information and help us make sense of this massive amount of data that we now have access to, but very challenging to, to work with it in its raw form. And what businesses are doing, and I'll use sales as an example, because sales is one of the areas where it's most mature. If you look at the growth of CRM over the past 20 years, you have companies like salesforce.com that have become standardized mm -hmm. as platforms across major companies. And, mm -hmm. and all of these platforms have app stores. So you can buy other apps and you can plug them in. And one of the first things that people plug in to Salesforce is a data source that has uh, phone numbers and email addresses and contacts of uh, uh, potential business partners or, or uh, current uh, customers. And it is so much more advantageous to get this information from a data store than it is to have your customers or your prospects type it in or for you to type it in yourself. And so that's an example of, uh, you know, predictive orchestration in sales where the data is being ported in to the right place at the right time right. through seamless integrations. And now that's arguably, you could just say automation rather than being really orchestration. But where it gets predictive is when you import live feeds from social media and from other places, and then you can provide things like the next best step to sellers. So when they have a prospect, they're more aware, oh, this company was just acquired. So your next best step is to reach out with a message that looks like this. Um, or if you look at a system like Gong, for example, which does live coaching for people on phone calls <laughs> with uh, sales reps, this, this is actually giving um, kind of, you know, post facto analysis, and then also some, um, you know, like some information to the people that are actually doing the doing the selling and doing the customer interaction. And so this, um, this technology, we believe, is going to be a true marriage of artificial intelligence, machine learning, with the human dimensions of commerce, where um, in fact, machine learning actually doesn't trade off with human relationships. It actually makes those relationships more precise, more robust. It means that you, you know, never forget someone's birthday or you never um, have to worry about if you've missed a deadline or a date. You just become a, a more precise um, kind of capable operator in any role. Yeah, exactly. Better exactly. Human. Right. No, that's great. So let's. What's so what's coming for uh, uh, name change was 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 very evident. That's great name as well. So what's what's next for orchestra and what's next for admin, right? So what's next twelve months and eighteen months look like? What's what's you know in terms of product roadmap or initiatives or expansion? Yeah. So you know, in terms of our product roadmap, we're always really excited um, to be delivering a, a slew of great new capabilities to um, to our customers. And so, you know, one that I would um, would call out is, um, you know, the ability for uh, suppliers uh, in um, the network to receive uh, really kind of a full stack uh, recommendation set and calendar associated with interactions that happen across um, their relationship with with a given customer. And so um, today, for example, the quarterly business review process is something that takes a lot of time to gather the information. It has yeah. to be validated. Yeah. 
uh, and so on. And so one of the things that a couple of our customers came to us and they said, look, we now have a lot of data from, from our ERP system, our MRP system, um, our supplier relationship management system that can be brought together in our Kestro for the purpose of modeling and predictive modeling. Why don't we do our quarterly business reviews and some of our even stakeholder uh, reviews with reports that live in this system? And rather than having to create the reports or update them, they're updated automatically. And in fact, you can even get a look ahead to see what might happen in you know, the next quarter or with specific suppliers. So that's something we're really, really excited about. Um, another thing that, that we see coming down the pipe is um, really uh, custom alert sets. So orchestration is also about always about making sure that the right person at the right time has the right information, ideally delivered in an email or in whatever channel makes the most sense. It could be a text message. It could be what, uh, and it, ideally the person at the end of at the, who's receiving the notification should be able to configure the channel. Um, and so that's something that we're very, very excited about in terms of not just reporting where it's kind of passive and you have to go in and find what you need in a report, but you can actually be alerted when there's changes in data that might be exceptions or anomalies. So really getting um, our customers to a true managed by exception workflow for at least a couple of their important KPIs. Um, and then in terms of expansion, uh, all supply chains are global, and we really see um, an opportunity to deliver predictive procurement orchestration. Uh, it's already available in multiple currencies and multiple languages, uh, but we really want to hone our internationalization and localization so that uh, a supply chain where people are communicating in different languages and there might not be uh, crosswalk fluency for every member of the team. We want to bring all of those people that are involved in the transaction, involved in the partnership, uh, in uh, into those those communication streams through 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 multi uh, seamless uh, and culturally appropriate multi language communication. That's, so that's something we're investing uh, that's heavily. Super, that's super fantastic. I mean, I'm I'm glad to be part of you know. I'm I'm actually super excited to see your journey. I I see you guys. You know very small team and now you have, I think, expanded greatly as well. I met a lot of people a bit up when I was there in New York a few weeks ago. I think one of the best conferences I've seen. Uh, I think I've added one of the, you know, one of the, let's call it keynotes video where Edmund had explained the, the BSF example and how they benefited. So you can see that it was a grand stage, one of the best events. So thank you for having me and thank you for joining the show today. Really enjoyed and I, I always almost admire the the clarity you explain the very complex uh, concept right not many people can do that right so well done thank you for thank you for being with me and talking to us and uh, any last comment before we finish well you know Dr. Mudis here I just want to say I think you you and SCM Dojo are doing great service for the supply chain community and creating great educational resources. Uh, I personally really enjoy your videos on, uh, especially on demand planning, uh, of course, many topics as well. Um, and um, I've um, taken some of your courses for fun and just really enjoy what you've, you've done for, for the community, especially globally. So hats mm -hmm. off to you and hats off to the, uh, the SCM Dojo team. Great, great. We are, and this is what we're doing. We're trying to help as many people as possible, as many brands as possible. And we almost trying to do it selflessly, right? Because I think the more people will engage, everybody will benefit, right? Thank you, Edmund. Have a good day, and uh, I'll see you soon. Maybe next year or this year. Let's see. Take care. Ciao. Bye. All right. Cheers. Bye. All right. Cool. <laughs>